Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Uh, we're delighted to have you here today at FaithBridge. My name is Duffy Robbins. Uh, I want to welcome all of you, and uh, uh, whether you're here at Faith Bridge uh, joining us uh, in Center Court East right here, or watching over in Center Court West, or joining us online, or from our new uh, Woodlands campus, uh, we are delighted that you're here. Let me just say a special uh, shout out to you folks in the Woodlands, uh, because uh, this is kind of great that you're here today. This is my first chance to share in worship with you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, for joining us on this uh, Mother's Day Sunday morning. How many moms, how many moms do we have in the room this morning? Would you raise your hand? All right, let's give these moms a round of applause. Thank you, moms. Great. Thank you, yeah. We're gonna actually dismiss you early so you can prepare lunch uh, for us. And uh, <laughs> uh, no, you know what? That's, that's, that's part of the privilege of being a mom. Uh, seriously, you can stay the entire time, but after lunch, if you don't mind helping us clean up, that'd be great. <laughs> one, of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, websites is a website called Awkward Family Photos. Anybody ever heard of Awkward Family Photos? This is a, a, a website that kind of showcases family picture outtakes, uh, or just those family pictures that, you know, that didn't quite work. Uh, in some cases, family photos that, that frankly just somehow went horribly bad. Uh, and uh, and you, you, you'll, yeah, you just go, what were they thinking? Um, I, you, you go to Awkward Family Photos and you get a chance to see moms and dads and kids uh, posing with the family snake. Uh, or uh, <laughs> you get a chance to, uh, you're, 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 you're unhappy about this, but it was a very powerful devotion on Adam and Eve. I wish you could have been there. But uh, anyway, we get a chance to see families posing uh, gleefully on the grave of a family member. Uh, this, is a, this is a warm and lovely shot. Poignant moments uh, that capture those special memories for father and son. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Auger Family Photos also gives you a chance to see dads uh, showing their daughters how zany and cool they can be. Uh, and they give us a chance to see kids who, judging by the expression on her face, think dad is neither zany nor cool. Uh, and, and of course, they're, they're more traditional uh, shots where all the family members pose together uh, with their dust busters. Uh, and I'm not sure what prompted that picture, but maybe somebody, you know, we don't, we don't have a picture of all of us with our dust busters. But uh, some of my favorite uh, awkward family photos are, are the ones uh, that what I would call sort of the, the let's all dress alike genre. Uh, so, so you get everything from the, the lumberjack look uh, to the uh, let's go sunflower look, uh, to the mom likes to sew outfits made of plaid fabric look, uh, to this look, which um, is, is I basically, I, I call this like Paisley 60s meets uh, breast cancer awareness. But uh, yeah, and, and then you get those kind of warm, touching photos where we, where we get to see dads being dads by playing toss the crying child in the air or uh, by traumatizing junior uh, by feeding his limbs to a hungry llama. Uh, <laughs> and of course, nothing, nothing says nurture like dad changing the baby in front of the gun rack. <laughs> yeah, we were going to save that for Father's Day, but... Uh, you know, and then I say to the last, uh, my very favorite recent picture on uh, 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 awkward family photos. Um, I'm not even sure what the deal is uh, with this <laughs> picture. Uh, it just sort of feels like you could almost base a novel on that photo. Maybe, maybe some sort of crime drama. Um, but I, I wanted to start here this morning with awkward family photos on this Mother's Day Sunday. Because in, in my 36, 37 years of, of ministry... Uh, most of it youth ministry, I've, I've kind of come to a, a very basic conviction. And that conviction is this, that every family somewhere in some scrapbook posted on some Facebook page has some awkward family photos. And the reason for that is because all of us, all of us live in awkward families. All of us live in awkward families. Don't get me wrong, families are great. I love mine, I, I hope you love yours. But when you put more than one human being in a living space, 
And then you expect those two or more assembled human beings to live their lives together in a closed area, to eat together, uh, do chores together, share bathrooms together. You have a whole lot of awkward waiting to happen. And, and, and then you add a couple of teenagers into the mix uh, and some middle-aged adults and a cell phone and Justin Bieber, uh, and you are well on your way to a soap opera. So, so uh, you know, I think all of us to some extent know what it's like to live in an awkward family. Um, whenever you talk about families, uh, especially if you're going to, you know, preach or teach on awkward families or families of any kind, one of the first questions that people inevitably ask is, well, Duffy, um, do you yourself, uh, you know, have... Uh, a family. Are you married? Do you have children? Uh, have you parented a teenager? Some of you know I've talked about uh, my family before. Um, but, but yeah, I, the answer is yeah. In fact, uh, this is a picture uh, of an awkward Robbins family photo. Um, <laughs> that's one we had taken at the wedding. But, uh, but it, it is... Um, no, actually, their mom prefers that I use this picture. Um, I have two daughters and one wife, which has worked out great. Uh, the, uh, the woman in the middle there is my wife. That's Maggie. Married her 41 years ago. And, uh, and that has been a tremendous blessing. Uh, and it's been good for me too. And, uh, and, and, um, and then um, in the, uh, on the left-hand side, the redhead, that's my older daughter, Erin. She's 37. And Erin and her husband and children live in Durham, North Carolina. And then uh, Katie with the green scarf on the right lives in the D.C. area. And the Katie's 34 and due to be married in October. Hallelujah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of, and then here's a picture of the whole clan. Uh, everybody, uh, husbands, fiancés, uh, grandchildren, and, and the whole group. You know, it's funny. I remember thinking as a youth pastor that, uh, that, that when we had our own children, after all those years of, you know, of parenting other people's uh, kids as a youth pastor and sort of being a part of that process, that, that, um, that we would sort of have a leg up on, on parenting, um, that, that uh, you know, that, that, that we would sort of kind of have a head start on this thing. Um, but we learned early on uh, that, 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 that um, all the answers are easier when it's other people's children. You know, I can still remember the first time, and, and those of your parents, you know what this is like, especially if you're a parent of a teenager, the first time we had to deal with one of these questions where our, you know, adolescent daughter had asked us for permission to do something. And, and you're going, oh my gosh, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and you, you don't know, you know, what you should say. And we're laying there in bed and there's kind of that exasperation. Should we say no? Should we say yes? Should we say maybe? Should we say, you know, I, I think that's a felony. And, and, and just wrestling through those questions, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy. And, 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 and actually, to be fair, I should also say to those of us here this morning who are the permission askers, uh, if you're a, a, a child, if you're a teenager uh, here this morning, I, I get it. it. It's not, it can't be terribly easy living with people, uh, after all, who grew up listening to disco uh, and, and whose parents showed them affection by buying them pet rocks. And, and so uh, I, I feel a little bit of your pain. All of us live in awkward families. And yet, and yet, it's in these awkward families that God often does his deepest most lasting, most profound work in our lives. The, the research is, is vividly clear. Whether you're talking about nurturing spiritual growth or, or diminishing the risk of at-risk behaviors or, or developing positive traits of healthy maturity and self-control, every child's best chance at success and healthy, happy life starts with their family. It starts with the family which is why scripture takes family so seriously. And which is why any serious attempt to live out our faith and be obedient to scripture means we need to be intentional about living out our faith in these awkward families. I think that's a big part of what the apostle Paul is pointing us to in a passage of scripture we wanna look at for a few minutes this morning. If you have a Bible, uh, I want to invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, if you just shoot your hand up in the air, uh, we'll make sure that, uh, that you get one. 
Just raise your hand. We'll make sure that you have a Bible. You can read along. Uh, if you're not used to thumbing through a, a Bible, uh, it's a big book. Colossians is near the back of it. Uh, it's in the New Testament after the Gospels, after Acts. Um, you're going to want to look for Colossians. This is chapter 3 of Colossians, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. We're going to put it up there on the screen so that we can all read it out loud together. So uh, let, let's read together Colossians Uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Let's read. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let's skip down to verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands, for this pleases the Lord, as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord. This passage of scripture is a passage of scripture that that, that reminds me what it is I love about the Bible. Um, and, and it's simply this, that the Bible um, is unflinchingly honest and unapologetically practical. Uh, at the outset of this passage, in verse 12, Paul calls us to, to savor the compassion of a God who has chosen us. A, a God who, who, who calls us holy and, and beloved. But Paul doesn't want to sort of just allow us to picture the Christian life as a bunch of uh, airbrushed, you know, posed, glossy photos. Beginning immediately in verse 13, Paul calls us to live out this grace right in the midst of the awkwardness, in vivid day-to-day relationships. Relationships that, according to verses 13 to 17, are marked by, by, by compassion Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, forbearance, and peace. But then to make absolutely sure that that he's keeping it real, to to make sure we don't think of this as some kind of, uh, you know, spiritual hallmark card, then in verse 18, Paul plunges us into the nitty-gritty of real families, real relationships, wives, husbands, parents, children, even the bond servants, basically everybody who lives in the household. And what I'd like to do in our time this morning is look at three simple ways that this passage suggests that, that, that awkward families, those of us gathered here in Faith Bridge today, on this Mother's Day Sunday, what are some ways that we can live out this kind of, of grace? The very first idea that I want to lift out of this passage this morning is simply this. Awkward families, awkward families that live out amazing grace are families that see each other as real people. Awkward families that live out amazing grace are families that see each other as real people. I think one of the traps that we easily fall into in in families is we start to kind of see each other as in stereotypes, you know, I, I've just lots of times in talking to, to, to middle school, high school students, you know, they'll, they'll talk about their parents and you just, you sort of hear these stereotypes. They categorize us like my dad, uh, my dad, oh my gosh, dude, dad is like a drill sergeant. Like that's kind of what he does. He, he sits there in the family room and just shouts orders. You know, he's like, mow the lawn and cut the grass, you know, Wash the car and do it fast. And, and, uh, and you know, and, and, and then mom, mom, uh, like, she just likes cleaning stuff. Uh, she just loves the smell of, of pine and lemon. And, uh, and, and that's kind of what she, and my little brother uh, is demon possessed. And, and you sort of get these stereotypes that, you know, what we, we start to think of family members in terms of categories. Part of understanding grace 
in our families is recognizing that these people in my family are not just props on the stage of my life. These people, to use Paul's words, are chosen by God. They're holy. They're they're dearly loved. They're created in the image of God. They're loved by God. These people are not just scenery around which I move and act as I live out the drama of my epic story. These are real people. These are real people with real needs, real hopes, real feelings, just like like you. I I don't know how many times uh, in in conversation I'll hear a a, a 16-year-old say, well, you know what? My parents, like, they don't understand me. Like, they just don't understand me. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and I'll go, well, okay, I get that. I, that's, that's, I, I, that's probably true to some extent. But let me ask you a question. Do you understand them? Like, what, what are you doing to try to understand, understand them? Like, what one guy was saying to me, my dad is, like, so uptight about money. He's, like, totally stressed about money. Like, he goes around our house just turning off electrical stuff. You know, like, he, he's the electricity sheriff. And, and uh, I mean, thank goodness nobody's on life support. Uh, I mean, it, it's just what he does. And, and, and uh, I remember not too long ago, this girl said, this teenage girl said, my mom, is weird, my mom, I was showing her this picture of me and my friends at the prom on Facebook. And my mom, as she looks at it, just starts crying. And I said, I said, well, I said, let me, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, have you thought about what it's like to, to, like, to be your mom? And I don't mean that alone would make someone weep. I'm just saying, uh, I'm just saying have, you, have, you, have you thought about what it's like to be your mom? Like, like your mom, when she looks at that picture, she remembers when she used to look like that. She used to, and, and you know what? It wasn't but about 20 minutes ago. I mean, it doesn't seem very long ago. She sort of, and, and now... You know, this thing that used to be this cute dimple is kind of a, a, a crater on the moon. And, 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 and you know, she puts in the Jane Fonda workout DVD and the screen just says, be realistic. And, you know, the, 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 the part was kind of understanding, understanding, you know, maybe the reason your little brother always wants to hang around tag along is just because he thinks you're so often. Part of living out amazing grace in awkward families is trying to feel along with other members of the family. That, that's literally what the word compassion means. It means feeling alongside, seeing each other as real people. And the hardest part of that, frankly, is not understanding that they're created by God, holy and dearly loved. The hardest part is understanding that these people created by God, holy and dearly loved, are also sinners. They're sinners, right? Because saints, we can live with. Uh, It's the sinners in the family that make life difficult, right? Sinners are the ones who get in moods. Sinners are the ones who don't want to do their share of the housework. Sinners are the ones who who sort of uh, think that God appointed them king of the remote. Uh, You know, sinners are the ones who who leave dishes in the sink. Sinners are the ones who forget to pick up. Sinners are the ones who forget to put the seat down. Uh, it's, and that's a gross sin. And, 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 and Paul is reminding us here, look, every member of your family is a sinner. Get real. Get used to it. That's why he adds this critical phrase at the end of verse 13. Look at the text. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Awkward families extend amazing grace by seeing each other as real people, awkwardness and all. Which brings us to the second, second big idea, and that's this. Um, awkward families exercise grace, first of all, by seeing each other as real people. Secondly, by taking initiative. By taking initiative. Um, uh, I was, I was doing this high school event a while back, and, and I was trying to kind of figure out a way that I could make vivid this notion of, of initiative. And, um, and, and, and so we, we did a little bit of an experiment. I actually brought three people up from the, the group and uh, there were two girls and a guy. And, um, and, and then I proposed that we play a little game. Um, I said, we're going to play a game of tug of war, except we're not going to use a rope. 
we're going to use the guy. And, and so I instructed each of the young women to grab this guy's hands. And I said, when I give you this signal, I want you to begin pulling as hard as you can in opposite directions. Just pulling as far as you can in the opposite. One of the things I've learned in speaking to teenagers over the years is when things start to get slow, it helps if you dismember someone. And, and, and so, and so I, I, I said, okay, let, let's try this. And, and, uh, and I go, you know, one, two, three, go. And it's just amazing. All of a sudden, these beautiful, you know, cute, nice girls just like, ugh, start like a tractor pull. And, uh, and they're just jerking this guy's arm in both directions. And, uh, and, and it was awesome. And we're still dealing with some of the legal issues. But, but, but it was awesome. I had him take a seat. And I said, now, I don't know if you saw this. But something just happened up here. It was kind of amazing. I mean, I'd, I'd never met the guy. I didn't give me any instructions about what I wanted him to do when they began to pull. But that guy basically, he, he realized something. When he heard me give them instructions, you're going to pull his arms in opposite directions. There was something in his brain that went, hey, that could hurt. And, 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 and so without me giving him any word of instruction or advice or coaching, he did something that I didn't tell him to do. He began to pull them towards him. He began to do what he could. He knew, I can't control her. I can't control her. I can control me. And so he took initiative. He began to pull them towards him. Um, we live in a culture, don't we? Where, where there are lots of forces pulling at our families. Lots of forces that rip at our relationships. They're, they're the financial concerns. There are, there are other kinds of relationships outside of the family. There, there are families who are just trying to, you know, just issues are just trying to grow up. Sometimes there are more severe issues, issues of illness, issues with alcoholism, uh, issues that, that, that are very, very difficult, and they often pull our families apart in, in violent ways. What Paul reminds us in this passage is that we have a choice to make. Every one of us in this room has a choice to make. We can give up and just let the forces of breakdown and break up pull our families apart, or we can take the initiative to do what we can do to pull the family together. Now, it's true. You, you, you cannot. You cannot completely control the pull of the culture. You, you cannot completely control the behavior of any other person in your family, but you can control the behavior of you. You see, we live in a culture that, that, that wants to basically say that we're all victims, that, that when something goes wrong, well, it's their fault and their fault, and it's not my fault, and we're being ripped apart. And, and I get it, there's, there's much that may not be our fault, but what we can do is what we can do, and that is to pull together. Say, so I'm going to do what I can I'm going to do what I can to take initiative, to make my family a place of grace. And grace always takes initiative. In fact, if you go back and you look at this text, verses 13 to 15, Paul uses three phrases, three phrases to remind us what we can do. He says we can bear with each other. We can forgive each other. We can clothe ourselves with love. A, a, a good real life translation might simply be grip and pull. Grip and pull. Now you're going, but Duffy, you don't, you don't know um, the, the, the stresses in my family. You don't know the kind of pressures that are pulling our family apart. You don't know the pain I, I've grown up with. You don't know the hurt he's caused. You don't know the betrayal we've experienced. And you're absolutely right. That, that's true. I'm not trying to minimize that. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. This is a forgiveness that's modeled after the forgiveness of Christ. Look at what the text says. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Not, not forgive if they apologize to you. Not forgive if they forgive you. But forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, we live in a culture that says, well, you know what? I'll go halfway. I'll go halfway. They come halfway, I'll go halfway. Look at the cross. Look at the gospel. There's nothing halfway about Jesus' forgiveness. Thank God. 
Thank God the, 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 the gospel is not about us coming halfway and God meeting us halfway. God went the whole way. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that, that's the initiative of, of grace. And you go, okay, all right, but, but what does that look like in practical terms? terms. Bottom line this thing for me. What does that look like in practical terms? Well, well, one of the ways that we play out initiative is just in being willing to say I'm sorry. You know, being willing to say I'm sorry. I mean, for some reason, this is so hard for us. I I know um, I was talking to a group of teenagers about about how this might play out in, in, in their lives. And, and, and I just took an every you know, day scenario. Let's say it's, let's say it's um, <clears throat> Friday night and, and you've come home late uh, after curfew and um, your, your you know, dad meets you there in the den and, um, and, and you walk in and, and the first question, where have you been? You know, and you, nowhere, what were you doing? Nothing, who are you with? Nobody. And, uh, and just, you know, and, and they went, well, you, how come you're late? Well, how come you are? So, whatever, you know, just, just chaos, you know. Nobody wants to take any initiative to make peace whatsoever. So, so what does it look like to practice the initiative of grace? Let's rewind. All right. So, so uh, you know, you come in. Okay, you come in late. Uh, you know, but, but when you get there, you're just, where have you been? Nowhere. What were you doing? Nothing. Who are you with? Nobody. Just get that out of the way. And, and then, uh, well, well, yeah, where are you? 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 Spying on me. Well, dad, what? You know? what? Dad, I want to tell you something. What? I want to tell you that, first of all, I realize the only reason you're sitting in this room and waiting up for me is because you care about me. And I want to say, I'm sorry. I, 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 um, <laughs> and I know I don't tell you enough, but I want to say, I love you guys also. Boom. Now, now see, that, that's what initiative, that's what initiative looks like. Initiative is saying, I'm going to take the first step. You know, it's not about 50-50. It's not about 50-50. It's about 100 no matter what. Or, or here's another way to take initiative in a family. What if, what if we decided, every one of us in this room this morning, every one of us over in Center Court West, every one of us in the Woodlands Camps, everyone is watching online. What if we all decided that we are this week going to do a random act of grace in our household? When I was a teenager, I was an expert at avoiding labor. Like, I, I never, I, I would never get up during a meal. Never get up from the table. Because in my family, if you got up from the table, somebody would go, oh, hey, why are up? Would you bring back some iced tea and bring the butter and, and wash the car? You know, and, and uh, you know, you, 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 and, so, and so I never, what, here's what initiative looks like. Here's what grace looks like. Suppose, suppose you just some day this week, you get up from the table and simply say, hey, uh, I'm going to the kitchen. May I get anyone anything? <laughs> yeah, your dad goes, yeah, bring your mother some smelling salts. Uh, <clears throat> she just passed out, drowning in the gravy. But, but basically, that's what initiative is. Families that live out the amazing grace of Christ are families with people who love first. They're families who take initiative. So you have two big ideas. See each other as real people. Take initiative. Let me mention the third, and that's communicate. Communicate. Families that want to live out grace in the midst of the awkwardness are families that will intentionally communicate with one another. It was the great theologian, Irma Bombeck, who uh, recounts uh, an incident where this uh, 17-year-old girl in the rush of everyone getting ready one morning uh, yelled out to no one in particular, has anybody seen my blue sweater? And the dad yells back, you mean the one that cost 80 bucks? And the mom goes, oh, you mean the one I have to hand wash in cold water? The grandmother says, oh, you mean the one with the low neckline? And the little brother goes, oh, you mean the one that makes you look fat? And, and, And all of these people are talking, but nobody 
is communicating. You know, grace has to involve communication. Grace that isn't communicated is cheap grace. It's no grace at all. When you look at this passage of scripture, living out kindness, living out forgiveness requires communication. Now, I I get it. There there are some some, uh, struggles and some barriers and some obstacles to communication in family. But let me just say a word, uh, first of all, those of you who are parents. Um, Because I think sometimes as parents, we are our own worst enemy. One One of the principles that we often forget as parents is this, that when you're a teenager, when you're a teenager, it, it, it's true even as a child, but it becomes even more true as you move into adolescence, that when you're a teenager, if an adult wants to talk with you, that's usually a bad sign. That, that's usually not going to go well. Like, remember, remember when you were in high school and you're sitting in the homeroom and somebody goes, please send Duffy Robbins to the office. What did everybody in the homeroom do? Yeah, right? But they know you're not being invited there because the principal's lonely. You know, you, you have violated, you know, some, some sanction. And, 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 and so part of the problem here is we have so programmed our kids, we only speak to them to correct them. We only speak to them when, when they've done something. Mean, even my own children. I mean, used to just crack me up and say, hey, Aaron and Katie, come downstairs. You know what they'd say? Are we in trouble? Do we do something wrong? Like, we don't allow them on the ground floor except for torture. (laughs) Come on down. Your mom's got the machete. Be brave. (laughs) Builds character. I mean, they're they're just just this this, this vibe. And I think part of it is, is, and frankly, it's a malady of, of, of being a parent, is that you want everything to be a teachable moment. And the harder we try, the more we fail. It's like trying really hard to go to sleep. You, you, you know, when you really, really try to make sure that every moment is a teachable moment, you pretty much shut down the communication process that is required for good teaching. It's like a dad told me not too long ago. He said, I don't know what happened to me. When, when my son became a teacher, I used to be able to talk to him. Now, every time we get together, it's all I can do not to try to, to, to teach. It's a, he said the other day we were in the car, and my son, my, my son goes, Dad... Just, just ask him, when did they first start paving roads? He said, it was all I could do not to say, you know, son, the road to hell is paved. Good take. You know, I mean, it, it, it's just what happened. I, I, I think that one of the best things I did as a parent, one of the best things I did as a parent was I would take my daughters to breakfast every other week. And I started that when they were little girls, little girls. But I did that all the way through high school. One girl, one week, one girl the next week. And, and of course, when they were little girls, they loved this. They thought this was awesome. We go to McDonald's. Oh, my gosh. And food wrapped in paper. And, uh, and they just thought that was amazing. Uh, and, and then by the time they got into high school, they're going, Dad, if we're going to have to get up early, like we're going to eat at the Marriott and do the buffet. And, and, you know, they go, Dad, how come you're not eating, sweetheart? We can't both afford to have breakfast. You enjoy your pork and your fruit. But, but, but here's, what a lot of, here's what a lot of parents don't understand. It's not like every single one of those breakfasts was this really intense, teachable communication. You know, honey, pass the orange juice. Let's talk about fornication. You know, if, 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 if you do that, basically when your child becomes an adult and somebody mentions bacon, they're going to have a nervous tick. You know, and, and, and so it, it's not about making every single breakfast a serious deal. The whole point is this. I had 10 breakfasts so that in the 11th breakfast, we could have a conversation we really needed to have. Most adults, they only want to have the 11th conversation. And it won't work. This kind of grace, this kind of grace takes time to develop. It takes time to age. It takes time to prove itself. And, and, and that is a matter of being willing to listen and being willing to be present. Now, let me just say one thing, those of you who are children and teenagers. Um, I don't know how many times, how many times I've heard parents say, well, you know, uh, I've talked to my child, but they don't, they don't respond. They don't, they don't seem to want to open. I mean, sometimes parents say, I can't get him to shut up. But, 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 but quite often it's, you know, what happened at school today? Nothing. What'd you do? Nothing. You know, and it's all kind of monosyllabic. I, I can still remember times we'd go away on retreats and, 
And, and it's the last night of the camp, and this 17-year-old junior in high school is standing there going, I love my mom. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't tell her I love her. Oh, my gosh. She's like, awesome. You know, and, 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 and it's great. And then they get home, right? And they get off the bus, and there is the mom that's so awesome. And she goes, well, how was it? Huh? Well, was it fun? Huh? Well, how was the food? Uh. And he cute girls, ah. And, and, and it's like, it, it, you know, then this kid comes to me and says, my parents don't understand me. I go, that's right. They're not pigs. You know, I, I mean, if you want them to understand, you're going to have to move beyond the monosyllabic. You're going to actually have to talk and share. This kind of grace requires communication. If I were to take all of these principles and take this passage and, and, and sum it up in terms of what it might mean for us on this Mother's Day Sunday, I would describe it in very simple terms as the principle of grace. The principle of grace simply says this, awkward families become loving families by practicing amazing grace. Awkward families become loving families by practicing amazing grace. Maybe it's just because I had two daughters. I don't know, but something about them, everything had to be exactly equal. Exactly. Fair. Like the, the, over and over, he says, that's not fair. I'm like, it's like, that is like so not fair. You know, everything had to be exactly equal. Like I was sure they were going to grow up to be lawyers. And, and, uh, and, 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 and I remember one day we were literally, we're, we're, we live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. We're driving up the hill, Valley Forge Mountain. And we're on the way to, I'm taking them to school. And my older daughter, Erin's in the passenger side front seat. The sun was right in our eyes as we're going up the hill. And just to make conversation, I went, wow, that, that sun is bright this morning. And Erin says, that's not fair. I said, you're right, Aaron. It's not fair. When daddy gets home, phone calls will be made. Heads will roll. But, but there's just sort of this idea, you know, that everything, and, and I mean, I kept hearing this. And finally, one day, I just stopped the car. I just stopped the car. I said, look, them both of them. I said, you know what? You do not want what you deserve. Trust me. None of us in this family wants what we deserve. We want Grace. We want grace. It's like the woman who had her portrait done. You know, and when it was over, she said to the artist, I don't like that. That, that picture does not do me justice. He said, man, with a face like yours, you don't want justice. He said, you want mercy. You want mercy. You know what? Every single person who hears my voice right now, what we do not want is justice. What we do hunger for is mercy. And here's maybe the most important part of this whole equation is that that doesn't come by me and you resolving to be better parents or me and you resolving to be better sons or daughters or grandparents or uncles or, or just resolving to kind of be a better person. That happens through only one way where we go back to the reservoir of grace that has been filled up with God's love that he made known to us through his son, Jesus. See, the, the, the dirty secret is that you and I don't have the capacity to love this way. We don't have it in us to be gracious. We don't have it in us to be patient. We don't have it in us to be forgiving. What we need in us is Christ in us, that he can take that sinful, selfish mentality and kill it and begin to raise a new life in us that is life of grace, a life of joy, a life of forgiveness, a life that allows us to live each day even in the awkwardness. Every single one of us on this Mother's Day Sunday wants to live in a family like that. We want to live in a church family like that. Every one of us deep down knows that kind of grace is something for which we were made. That happens. That happens. Only when we begin to see each other as real people, when we take initiative, when we speak the truth in love, and when we recognize that it's not about me being a good child or a good daughter or a good mom or a good dad. It's about me focusing on my relationship with my heavenly father, my heavenly father. Therefore, Put on as God's chosen ones, 
holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. There's an urgency there in the Greek. It's, it's, it's grip and pull. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let's pray. Lord, this is what we want. This is what we dream about. This is kind of, this is sort of scrawled across the hallmark cards of our hearts and brains. But we fall so utterly short. We know this. And so our prayer today, Lord, is not that you'd help us to kind of come up with more flowers, that you'd help us to write better cards. All those things are wonderful. But what we need, Lord, is to draw upon your life, your love, your grace in our lives. Maybe even this morning there's someone here you're visiting. You're here on Mother's Day Sunday, and you do not know this Jesus. You don't know his grace and his mercy. That, that, that you, you realize that I've fallen short of this, of this wonder of God's love. This day, this day can be a day where you turn to your heavenly Father and say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Thank you that your son Jesus died on the cross. He took initiative while I was still a sinner died for me and because he paid the debt of death that I owe for my sin and rose again I can have new life with him I can begin to live out this life and grace in my family thank you Lord what great news what a gospel on this Mother's Day we pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said Amen Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Marianne Reed, and this is Postscript. I'm sitting here with Duffy Robbins, and it is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. We just have a couple more questions for Duffy, um, so let's get started. All right, let's do it. Why do you think we tend to have unrealistic expectations of one another within our own families? Well, you know, I, actually, you know, C.S. Lewis talked about this in a broader sense. He said that he said that, you know, if we have these desires in our heart for for um, for a perfect love and perfect justice and, and perfect forgiveness then we should probably follow them to their source. And I, I think in a sense, what that reflects is that all of us still have in some kind of, uh, you know, primal way, we all have memories of Eden. And what I mean by that is that theologically, we know where, what families are meant to be. We, that there's something in us that longs for um, in a deep way. We, we often are sold a cheaper product and we'll try to settle for a cheaper product in the way that a man with a limp will try to live his life limping rather than do the procedure required to to walk properly but but deep down in his heart and in his leg he knows it's not supposed to be like this and so i think that we all of us um even even someone who's grown up in a family where there was you know abuse uh even those of us who grow up in families where it's great. I mean, th there's still that sense that it's, we all know what it's like to go, man, this conversation didn't go well. I didn't understand that. I was hurt by that. And I believe it's because we have this memory of Eden. We have this, this sense that God has put in us that for which we were created. And, and that's because we're created in the image of God. That kind of community that's reflected in the Trinity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the kind of community for which we were created. And, and uh, on this side of, of glory, you know, we're probably always going to feel that it's not quite there. Even the, the, the married couple that deeply love each other, mm -hmm. there are times when they, they hurt each other and they fall short. And, uh, and so 
I think that's because God gave us those desires. I think they're God-ordained desires. Um, that's why grace is important because I can sort of, I can sort of be so frustrated with you that you don't fulfill that desire and without going, well, wait a minute, I don't fulfill that desire either. You know, we, both of us have fallen, both of us mm -hmm. are broken and I'm never going to be able to, to do that. It's, it's sort of the, uh, it's sort of the old thing of trying to fill up a bucket with a hole in it. There's a hole in our soul. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I think there'll always be that sense of it didn't quite hit. There's a little bit of a miss there, even in really, really healthy families. What can you talk about? What about when we take initiative and reach out to somebody, but there's no response? Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be great it, it, today, you know, talking about initiative, I talked about, um, about saying, I'm sorry. I talked about serving, you know, random acts of grace. It would be great if, if, you know, you were to take initiative or a family member takes initiative and that just, you know, all of a sudden breaks the dam or the log jam. And now the river starts to flow cleanly and purely. And again, we all ride on the the white water, and it's just a great adventure. Um, real life tells us that that's not always the case, that, uh, that, that uh, sometimes I go and ask for forgiveness and there's still resentment or there's still bitterness, or even someone says you're forgiven, but they're not really forgiving me. Um, and, and of course, there is no, there's no simple answer to that. In, in a very real sense, that's a reflection of the way we've treated God. I mean, he has taken the first move to mm -hmm. us and, um, we, many of us have yet to respond. He doesn't stop. He doesn't say, okay, going once, twice, you're, you know, he continues to forgive, continues to extend grace to us. And that's what Paul means when he said, you know, forgive as Christ forgave you. Because otherwise I'm, I'm apt to go, look, I, I've given you every opportunity to get this right. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's not about how they respond to me. It's about how God responded to me. And, and so I need to forgive as, as, um, as Christ, uh, you know, bought my forgiveness and God forgave me on the cross. That, that, that's, again, kind of goes back to that conversation that Peter had with Jesus, you know, how many times we're supposed to give. And, mm -hmm. you know, and Jesus said 70 times seven, which was kind of a way of saying, just keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving. I think um, as parents, this is one of the real struggles um, I was just talking with a mom about this a couple of nights ago at a parents' conference, parents' uh, event, how her two sons, you know, she's a single mom, and her two sons um, are both teenagers. And, um, you know, who knows what they've been through and growing up without a dad and so forth. But mm -hmm. she said that, you know, they're just constantly flexing their muscles, and there's, she just feels like they, they just treat her badly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I can't make that go away and, and taking initiative might not make that go away. That was the whole premise of my sort of illustration that I can't affect, you know, the behavior of the person on that side and I can't affect the person on that side. I can only affect me, but I have to figure out what am I going to do from here? Am I going to be absorbed and, 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 you know, with bitterness and let that suck the life out of me? Or am I going to say, no, I am going to continue to take initiative and do what I can. But at the end of the day, um, I said to her, you know, I think in some ways parenting is, 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 is probably the closest to that kind of situation where you feel like you're extending grace, you're taking initiative. And, hey, nobody hung around to say thanks. Nobody said, you know what, you're right, Mom, I did need that correction. By golly, thank you for getting me to come in earlier. You know, you know, you know you're not hearing that uh, affirmation very often. I think a lot of times parenting, I always say it's the closest most of us will come to crucifixion because you, you reach out your arms to embrace them. And then it, sometimes it feels like they hammered a nail you know, right into your hands. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what unconditional, you know, God-like love looks like. And if we can appreciate how that feels to us, we can only begin to appreciate how that must feel to a heavenly father when we don't respond to his acts of grace. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Duffy. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And thank you for watching Postscript with our great friend, Duffy Robbins. Have a great Mother's Day and a great week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.